My name is Sarah McDonough and I am the Programs Manager here at the Lexington Historical Society. Today we will be having a virtual tour of the Hancock Clark House. So the first room on our tour is called the Keeping Room. Keeping in the 18th century just meant living, so technically this is a living room, although to our modern eyes it looks more like a dining room. And we like to start the tour in here because as a guest in this house in 1775, this is the first room that you would see. You would be ushered in here by the family to see the finest furniture, wallpaper, and portraits on the walls. And because of the portraits in here, it's also a great place to introduce the Hancock family. Because after all, this place is called the Hancock Clark House. On the wall, we have portraits of the Reverend John Hancock and his wife Elizabeth Hancock. They were the first owners of this house. Now this building was first constructed in 1737 with the help of the Hancock's wealthy son, Thomas. He was a merchant in Boston and the only one in the family who didn't enter the clergy. We think that Thomas paid uh, for this house in the same way that he paid for these portraits. There's a third one that's of him, which is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. During the Revolution, however, this house was owned by the Reverend Hancock's successor, Jonas Clark. So he was our uh, minister here during all of the revolutionary years. And when he first came to town, Madam Hancock was still living in this house. She decided to take in some boarders, and he was one of them. And of course, as wealthy widows are wont to do, she decided to start inviting her granddaughters over for dinner. And eventually, one of those granddaughters, Lucy Bowes, started showing up more and more often. And eventually, she and Jonas got married. So luckily, the house was able to stay in the family for well over 100 years. And in fact, Jonas and Lucy had 12 children in this house, so the place would have been much more crowded than it is today. A lot of the furniture in here would have been from the reign of uh, Reverend Hancock and would have stayed in here for quite some time after. So as we're walking through here, know that as much as possible, we've kept the house looking as it did in 1775, but a lot of the furniture in here is much older. So we've come into the kitchen now and things are a little bit more homey than they were out in the beautiful keeping room. No one is trying to impress you in here. This is a family only space. And so this is where Reverend Clark would be trying to um, manage his many, many children. We do have their original kitchen table in here. It can't quite fit all of the kids that would have been in the house, but perhaps they ate in shifts. We're not sure. Um, but of course, many hands make light work. And so all of the chores that would have had to be done in a place like this would have been helped uh, by having uh, such a large family. Of course, if you were a little bit wealthier, like the Hancocks, you could have um, some really fun state-of-the-art technology to help you out as well. So for instance, the kitchen hearth over here is pretty standard for the 18th century. We have some pots and pans, but in addition to this, we have something that is not original to this house, um, that perhaps someone like John Hancock may have had in his kitchen over on Beacon Hill. So this contraption sticking out of the wall is called a roasting jack or a clock jack. And essentially what it is, is a giant clockwork automatic rotisserie for all of your cooking needs. Now it's missing a few parts, but the basic idea here is that the chain that you see going around the back of the machine is attached on a wheel to the spit which is going across the fireplace. This is where you stick your meat. Now the front of this machine uh, would have a wrench type of apparatus that you would use to crank it up. And once that's done all you have to do is give that wheel on the top a spin. Those weights will start to slowly drop and everything will start churning itself so that the meat on the fireplace will start very slowly rotating. And that means that you don't have to do that yourself. Most families could not have afforded something like this. There are a lot of tiny, very precise moving parts in this piece of equipment. So in most households, you might see a plain spit like this with a handle on one end. Attached uh, to that handle, would be a small child on a stool. And then you would rotate the children every five minutes instead of 
cranking your clock jack every five minutes. So this would have been a private family room for the Clarks. It's the smallest room in the house, and this would be a good place to act as a nursery and a place for Mrs. Clark to keep track of all of her many kids as she was working in the kitchen. Now one of the great things about 18th century houses is that they're very symmetrical. So we have two rooms in the front of the house and two rooms in the back. In the front of the house we have a nice beautiful staircase that goes up to some more public facing bedrooms upstairs. And then there's also a back staircase in the kitchen that goes up to the children's rooms, which are above our heads. So you can almost think of the Clarks here living in something of a duplex. Again, if they're having guests over, they don't necessarily want to be tripping over their children. This is definitely a period of time where children were not seen or heard most of the time. But if you were to close the doors uh, and the wall going through the middle of this house, you could effectively keep the children in here and not really be bothered by them. They could have their own private living room in here, access to the kitchen and all the food they want, and then whenever they want they can head right upstairs to their bedrooms and go to sleep. This of course means that you do have to have responsible older children to act as babysitters. So when most people enter this room they assume that it's the master bedroom, but in fact we're in the guest room. This is another place where the Hancocks and the Clarks are trying to show off their immense wealth. So you would see this room when you first came into the house. We have some more beautiful 18th century wallpaper in here, paneling on the walls and beautiful tiles around the fireplace. And as this was the best room in the house, this was reserved for the most important guests, including John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who were staying here the night before the Battle of Lexington. They didn't feel safe being in Boston, with things being what they were with the British soldiers. So they decided to stay out here with family where they'd be a little further away from the action and would be more safe, while they were meeting with the Provincial Congress in Concord. And that's partially why Paul Revere came out that night. He was sent specifically to this house, along with his partner William Dawes, to get Hancock and Adams out of this house and out of harm's way. And it actually took him a couple of tries to do it. When he first got here at 11.30 at night, Hancock and Adams were not too keen on actually leaving. That's partially why Paul was here. He came in response to a message that John sent to the Committee of Safety in Boston asking if they could just talk about all of this British redcoat nonsense in the morning. Eventually, Paul and William Dawes told the two men to leave as soon as possible, and then they continued on their way. As some of you may know, they didn't actually make it all the way to Concord. About halfway there, they were overtaken on the road by some British soldiers. Paul attempted to escape, but was captured. Dawes managed to escape for a little while, but then he fell off his horse, and the horse ran away without him. And so that's why he is often sadly forgotten by history. But we will always remember him here. Luckily, there was a third rider that night that they had met on the road, a young doctor by the name of Samuel Prescott who was also a son of Liberty. He just happened to be leaving Lexington at the same time and was able to escape the British soldiers and make it all the way back home so that he could alert the people in Concord to what was happening. Now eventually, Paul Revere, being the smooth talker that he was, was able to allow the soldiers to let him go by letting them know just how many armed and angry country folk would be waiting for the rest of the army here in Lexington. So eventually, Horseless, he had to walk all the way back to Lexington, hoping to get some more help. When he arrived back here, at probably about 3 o'clock in the morning, he unfortunately found Hancock and Adams still sitting at this table over here, arguing about whether or not they should leave. At that point, we're not sure if Paul was able to physically remove them from the house, but I am assuming that he had some pretty strong words for them, and was finally able to get them to leave just before the battle started. So even though Paul Revere did not quite live up to the name that was written about him in the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere by Longfellow, he still accomplished his mission that night. And in fact, if it wasn't for some of his adventures that took place, Hancock and Adams might have actually been on the battlefield that day. Of course, if someone like John Hancock, who was 
one of the richest and most well-known people in Massachusetts, had been out on the green with no military experience, he would have been immediately shot. And then it's entirely possible that we might not have had a war because he was the one supplying us with much of our money and ammunition at that point. So we're very lucky that those two managed to make it out safely. Now we're in the master bedroom. It's a little less pretentious than the guest room downstairs. Unlike in modern day where you might want to decorate your own space, the Clarks were trying to save money and to spend what they had downstairs where people could appreciate it. But up here, a lot of people prefer this room because it's so nice and bright and airy. In the late autumn, the sun filters through the trees in the back and it gives this room a beautiful golden glow. So that makes it one of my favorite rooms in the house. The other reason that it's my favorite room in the house is because I get to tell you now what the women were doing while Paul Revere was having his antics downstairs. Because many people forget just how crowded this house was that night. So who else was actually in here? Sam Adams and John Hancock were staying downstairs, but up here were their guests. John was actually traveling along with his fiancee, Dorothy Quincy, and his elderly aunt, Lydia Hancock, who was Uncle Thomas's widow. So they were sharing the bed in the master bedroom upstairs. And honestly, we're not sure where the Clarks themselves were sleeping. They may have kicked some of their kids out of their beds. Part of the reason why we have such a good story to tell is that we have many oral histories and written histories from these characters. We know what happened on Paul Revere's ride because Paul himself was asked to write it down. But we also have many letters from the family that tells us some of the less, perhaps, history book important events, but very personally important events that happened during some of these tumultuous times. So for instance, Dolly Quincy herself, many, many years later, gave an interview with a gentleman from the Massachusetts Historical Society who published it, explaining what she did in the room that night. And we also have a letter from one of Reverend Clark's daughters, Betty, who was 12 at the time and was able to corroborate that account. So we know from the two of them that Aunt Lydia spent most of the night screaming and crying. This is understandable. Dolly, however, was trying to help Mrs. Clark calm down all of the children and hide the valuables in the space. Betty remembered everyone going up into the attic and down into barrels of potatoes in the basement to hide things like jewelry, money, and important notes. Eventually, it was decided that the women should stay in the house until after the soldiers had moved on. Splitting up from the men was considered to be the safest option. So Dolly and Lydia were actually in the house when the battle was taking place, and they would have been able to see the action from these front windows here. The Clark farm was quite large at the time, and they would have had an unobstructed view of the battle. There's even talk from much later in time that a bullet may have whizzed past the house at one point, but we don't know if that actually happened. Much of the furniture in this particular room has not been saved over time, but we do have one of the most interesting pieces in the house on display in here, and I think it fits in well with this room having more of a women's history bent. On the bed, we have a beautiful set of Cruel Work bed curtains. These were designed to keep you warm in the winter by creating sort of an igloo effect uh, around your body heat in the bed, and could also keep bugs away from you in the summer. These were made by hand during the Revolution by a local woman. They don't come from Lexington, but they were made nearby by a wonderful daughter of Liberty. And it's my favorite thing in the house because I see something new every time I look at it. This pattern is often called a tree of life because the branches come up and cover the entirety. But there are some really fun designs on here as well that I think the woman who made this put in just because she was getting a little bit bored. Um, you can imagine the amount of time that it would take to make something like this, according to our sources, about eight years in total. Everything from growing your own flax, raising your sheep, shearing, cutting, spinning, weaving, dyeing, and embroidering. So by the time I got to this last panel, I think I was going to be getting creative myself. So for instance, down at the very bottom here, we have a little shepherd man walking around with a goat. He's probably my favorite part of this. And then around the other side, we have a little parrot hiding in the trees. 
If you walk all the way around this, you'll see all different kinds of fruits and flowers and even some hearts. And this is one of the items in the house, just like the wallpaper we saw downstairs, that I think really exemplifies just how colorful life in the past could actually be. We like to think of these people as being very puritanical and not having access to some of the beautiful bright colors that we have today. And while some of it was limited, you can say that you saw it here, hot pink did exist in the 18th century. So welcome to Reverend Clark's study. This is the inner sanctum of the house, which probably would have had some closed doors most of the time. This is the desk that Reverend Clark would have written most of his sermons and his diaries, from which we get most of the information that we have about the house. Reverend Clark frequently wrote about the weather, what was happening on the farm, various important things going on in town. And so we have a wealth of information about the life of an average person in the 18th century from these documents that are still in our archives. We even have his entries from the Battle of Lexington itself. On that day, he started with a bit more uh, space than he needs for most of his entries. The regulars fired upon our men in Lexington, killed 10 of this town, 30 of other places, wounded many, burnt houses, etc clear and windy. The weather always comes first. We also have over here our only image of Reverend Clark. Now unlike Reverend Hancock downstairs, Reverend Clark did not have a fantastically wealthy son to pay for a formal portrait. And I suppose if he wanted one he could have bought it, but he seems to have been a pretty humble person. And so instead we have this beautiful silhouette that was cut by one of his children. So we have to sort of fill in the blanks as to what Reverend Clark may have looked like, but we do know from this portrait and from other accounts that he had a very impressive wig that you can see in the back there. Ministers often had very fluffy hair indeed. As the minister, of course, Reverend Clark was the most important man in town as your spiritual and town advisor in a sense. After all, he is the one preaching to you for several hours every Sunday. And so he was instrumental in making sure that this was a patriot town. Unlike some other areas, like Concord, where there were some factions, Lexington was really, as far as we can tell, 100% patriot. And a lot of that was due to Reverend Clark's connections with the patriot cause and his amazing ability to sway the parishioners to his own beliefs. So Lexington was a very close-knit uh, community at that time. And of course, if you were going to be sitting there uh, on a pew for many hours listening to Reverend Clark telling you about liberty, then you would probably absorb that. Now one of the most interesting things in this house, I think, is something that we uncovered a few years ago when restoring the house. In 2008, we finished up a complete uh, restoration of the house to make sure that it could last for another couple hundred years. That's when we found some of the wallpaper that you saw downstairs, but the best treasure was waiting for us up here. It was a tradition back in the day when you were building a new house to stick something inside the wall as a good luck charm. These were often shoes, and we found a pile sitting here behind the plaster work on this wall. So we have a variety of children's shoes and adult shoes stuck back here, as well as a cartridge box for holding bullets. Now keep in mind, this is only a century after the Salem witch trials, and people were still somewhat superstitious, even in the minister's home. So when this house was initially being built, the Reverend Hancock uh, would have been part of this ritual of putting these shoes in here. Of course, at the time, he didn't have any small children, so we're not entirely sure where the shoes come from. I like to think that perhaps some of the smallest shoes may have come from his grandchildren, or perhaps may have been saved uh, from his son Thomas, who paid for this house. But at any rate, they stayed here, more or less uh, unnoticed uh, and undiscovered, uh, until about 10 years ago. So it's rather incredible, I think, that they're still here to be viewed today. Our final stop on the tour is the children's bedrooms. They're of course directly behind Reverend Clark's study, so we think the kids back here were pretty well behaved. Although this wall down the center of the room may have been built to keep the kids from attacking each other in the middle of the night, we're not quite sure. But at any rate, 
this was actually somewhat of a luxury for 18th century children. In this time period, a lot of families were sharing uh, a bedroom, if not a bed, with their children. And so to have this much space uh, was rather unheard of, even for such a large family. The kids have two rooms in here, and these could have fit all of the children who were actually in the house on the night of April 18th. Because some of them were older and some hadn't been born yet, there were only nine kids in the house that night. So each of these rooms has a regular sized bed with a trundle underneath. This can be pulled out at night to fit another couple of children for sleeping. And then during the day, you just roll it back under the bed and you can have extra work or play space over here. The same thing exists in the back bedroom. Now, one thing that's more visible here than in some of the other bedrooms is the fact that all of these mattresses are held up by ropes that crisscross underneath them. This gives you a little bit more flexibility uh, in the comfort level of your bed back in the day, rather than having hard planks of wood. And in order to adjust that, you would use this tool sitting on the chest over here, which is called a bed key. Now I do have a little model of a bed here that can give you a better idea of what this looks like. So the basic crisscross pattern underneath here, but if you do want a little more uh, firmness in your bed, you could actually stick the bed key in between the ropes here and make it a little bit tighter. So right now these are pretty far tight, but in theory you could stick this under here and give it a little turn.